I am actually prepared this week. It's because this is not my recipe, that's why. Um, cool. This is the most prepared I've ever been for this, so. It's a new me. New week, new me. My kitchen is clean this week, and it's because I stuffed all of the cereal and snacks in that back corner, so hope you can't see it. Get your life together, Johnny. I told you guys I was gonna be super hydrated because of this, so. If you thought I was lying, I wasn't. Spooky Sunday dinners. Spooky Sunday dinners. Spooky Sunday dinners. Still can't afford a theme song. Hey guys, for those of you that don't know, my name is Johnny Taylor and this is Spooky Sunday dinners. Where every Sunday, every other Sunday, when I'm late on Monday, and I'm still thinking about Thursdays, we talk about a true crime story that I just really want to fucking talk about while we make a fairly easy recipe. So if true crime, cooking, and dark humor is right up your alley, you might want to hit that subscribe button below. This week is a very special episode because I have partnered with my friend Anna and her phenomenal blog, Bringing Out Beauty Within, to bring you guys a actually very easy, very healthy recipe. Anna created this recipe. I am just making it based off of her instructions on the blog to show you how incredibly easy and delicious this is. So her blog will be linked below. The recipe is on there and I would highly suggest signing up and checking out all the great stuff she has on there for you. Okay, you know what time it is. Am I ever gonna like doing this? It is Karen disclaimer time. All right, you know the drill. Disclaimer one. These are not professional recipes. This week is a little different and I'm recreating someone else's recipe. So I can confidently say this week, we are above mediocre. But if you create this and you don't like it or you fuck up and get sick, it's not my fault. It's also not Anna's fault. Don't even try it, Karen. Weekly disclaimer number two. This is spooky Sunday dinners emphasis on the spooky we talk about true crime murder disease spooky shit that's why this is called spooky sunday dinners now along with that as my coping mechanism for being obsessed with something so dark we add a nice sprinkle of comedy on top if this offends you in any way shape or form i don't care so before you comment email, DM me your complaints, don't. All right, we got that out of the way. It's getting easier and easier. This week, I am also wearing another top from Straight Out of the Coffin. Their website and Instagram will be linked below so you guys can check it out and maybe purchase a couple of your own. Now that all of that's out of the way, this week, we are finally talking about it, guys. You've asked me for it. We are going to cover the murder of Lacey Peterson. While we do that, we are going to be making my friend Anna's recipe. It is the Trader Joe's Cauliflower Gnocchi Pizza Bake. It's super easy, super delicious, and the perfect recipe to pair with some fucked up true crime. Let's go into some ingredients we are going to need. They will all be listed down below along with the link to Anna's blog where the full recipe is. But just so you don't get mad at me, here's what we're gonna use today. About one to one and a half bags of Trader Joe's cauliflower gnocchi, a bag of frozen vegetables. It says in the recipe you can pretty much use any frozen veggies you want. I went with the ones that she used that were pictured on the recipe. It is Trader Joe's organic green vegetable foursome. Some Trader Joe's tomato basil marinara, some canned Italian hot peppers, I will be using Violife mozzarella shreds. There's also another Trader Joe's brand alternative that is awesome. Or if you eat regular cheese, use that. A shit ton of Italian seasoning, some olive oil, and I'm just going to line my baking dish with some Pam spray. You don't have to. You can grease it however you want. This is just the lazy way to do it. All right, we are going to preheat our oven to 430 degrees. And while we do that, let's get into the story. 
we are going to do a little backstory on Lacey Peterson. If you don't know this case, haven't heard of it, or haven't seen it in the media, this shit is wild. Lacey Peterson was born on May 4th, 1975. She was born in Escalon, I'm probably not saying that right, you know by now I can't, California. She was born to Sharon and Dennis Robert Rocha. Lacey worked on her parents' dairy farm growing up and really enjoyed gardening, a hobby that would actually take her pretty far in her schooling. Lacey's parents got divorced when she was very young and her and her older brother, Brent, went to live in Modesto, California with her mother. Now, Modesto, California, from what I know at this time, was a very, very mom and pop town. Very all-American, don't lock your doors at night, everyone knows each other, your neighbors are friendly, kind of like you can go for a cup of sugar type of thing. I don't know, I'm not used to that. Come ask me for a cup of sugar. Come knock on my door and ask me for a cup of sugar. I know what you want. To murder me. Lacey had a pretty normal childhood. She was cheerleader in both middle school and high school. She went on to attend California Polytechnic State University. This is where she majored in ornamental horticulture. Like I said, love for gardening, blah, blah, blah. All right, so Lacey meets Scott Peterson while visiting her friend who happens to be his coworker at a restaurant in Moreau Bay. Moreau? Moro, Moro. I don't know, M-O-R-R-O. The restaurant was called Pacific Cafe and Lacey had a crush on him from the moment she saw him. She made the first move, slipped him her number and even went home after and told her mom that she met the man she was gonna marry. The fucking confidence. So they start dating. It gets pretty serious over time and Scott actually ends up giving up his dream of being a professional golfer to focus on business and going to school for that. They dated for about two years and ended up moving in together. While Scott finishes his senior year of college, Lacey takes a job in Prunedale and it's just a bit of a commute and this is actually where it is later discovered that this was the start of Scott's cheating. Yes, he was one of those. You know how we feel about those. They end up getting married in 1997, and after they graduate, they actually opened a sports bar in the area called The Shack. It did fairly well, but they ended up selling it in the year 2000 so that they could move back to Lacey's hometown of Modesto. They purchased a home in a pretty upscale neighborhood near La Loma Park. Lacey goes on to get a job as a substitute teacher, while Scott gets a job with Trade Corp USA. I don't know what the fuck that is. I'm not gonna Google his job. He's a fuck nugget. Spoiler alert, he sucks. During this time, Lacey's family says that she works really hard to try to be the perfect housewife. She loves to entertain people, have dinner parties, cook, clean, just be everything that I am not. Lacey and Scott announced that they are expecting their first child in the year 2002. Her due date was said to be February 16th, 2003. It was gonna be a little boy and they were going to name him Connor. Now, secretly this whole time, in November of 2002, while Lacey is seven months pregnant, Scott was introduced to a massage therapist in Fresno. He was introduced to her through a friend. Her name was Amber Frey and apparently Scott told her that he was single. He actually, we later find out, he told her that he lost his wife. He made it seem like she went missing and was murdered. And this was going to be his first holiday season without her. It was very hard. And Amber thought it was amazing that he confided that in her. Obviously they start a romantic relationship and Amber thinks she has met the man of her dreams. And look, whether you think he did it or not, can we at least agree that this guy is a total fucking asshole? Seven months pregnant, your wife at home, and you wanna go meet Amber? Hey, Scott. All right, our oven is preheated to 430. We are going to start to prep this dish. While I prep the first part of this, let's continue with the story. So on December 23rd, 2002, Lacey and Scott go and visit Lacey's sister. This is where Scott gets his hair cut 
like he does once a month with her and he actually lets her know that the next day he will go and pick up like a fruit basket situation that Lacey's sister Amy purchased for their grandfather for Christmas. This happens at around 5.45 p.m. and he makes it a point to let Amy know that he would be playing golf nearby that area. It's later found out that Scott told multiple people for an unknown reason that he was specifically going to be playing golf that day, Christmas Eve. That morning, December 24th, Scott says that he wakes up around 8 a.m., a little bit after Lacey. He stated that Lacey needed to wake up early so that she could eat right away because her morning sickness had not gotten any better through her pregnancy. He states that from 9 to 10 a.m., they actually watched Martha Stewart's cooking show. He even is able to tell you exactly what they were making on the show. He says that Lacey was getting ready to mop the floor and then she would be taking their dog Mackenzie out for a walk. At this time, he decides that it's actually too cold to go golfing, cancels his plans and says he's actually gonna go fishing instead. All right, you saw me pour two bags in here, but I ended up taking some out and I just kind of lined the bottom of the dish with the gnocchi. From here, I'm gonna drizzle some olive oil on it and Italian seasoning. I would like to point out that it doesn't make much sense to me that he thought it was too cold to go play golf, but it was fine to go out on the water and go fishing. I grew up going fishing. It's freezing. But Scott leaves and heads out to his warehouse where he keeps his boat. All right, I have drizzled my um, olive oil and Italian seasoning, stirred it up and made sure everything is mixed together. Now I'm going to add a layer, a pretty thin layer of the frozen veggies. So Scott goes to the warehouse. Um, they have proof that he spent some time there on his computer, loaded up their boat and headed out to the Berkeley Marina. At this time, it is said that Lacey is seen walking their dog Mackenzie. Okay, I've got my thin layer of veggies on top and I'm actually just gonna throw this in the oven at 430 for 22 minutes. This is gonna be the first part of the baking process. Around this time is also when a different neighbor says that she spots their dog Mackenzie running down the street. She's got her collar and her leash on, but Lacey is nowhere to be found. The neighbor doesn't think much of it because it's such a mom and pop town. She just grabs the dog and opens their back gate, puts the dog in the backyard, closes the gate, leaves the leash and the collar on her. There is a receipt where it does show that Scott parked his truck at that marina at 12.54 p.m. He states that he was out on the boat from about 1 to 2 p.m., loaded everything up and called Lacey on his way home. He stated that he called both their home phone and her cell phone. He did leave a voicemail that let her know it had gotten a little late. He was not able to go pick up the basket. He asked her to, then said he loved her, hoped to hear from her soon. You can go and listen to these. I can't tell if they sound real or fake. As I get more into the story, I've decided that they're fake as fuck. But when you first listen to them from like a totally unbiased area, and maybe it'll sound real to you. He drops the boat off at the warehouse at about 4.30 p.m. and says that he headed straight home from there. When he gets home, he notices that Lacey is not there and Mackenzie is in the backyard with her leash and collar still attached. He also notices that their front door is unlocked. He states that he just assumed she was at her mother's house. But then this motherfucker goes, takes off all of his clothes, immediately puts them in the washer and goes to take a shower. I mean, I'm calling it that's sus as fuck. He then says that he grabs some pizza from the fridge and then decides that he should probably call someone around 5.17 p.m., but not the police. He calls Lacey's mom. He's like, hey mom, is Lacey anywhere around? She's not home, so I just figured this entire time I haven't heard from my eight months pregnant wife she must be with you. Obviously, Lacey's mom is like, no, she's not fucking here. What is going on? And Lacey's stepdad at 5.47 p.m. says, fuck this, we are calling the police. 
Mind you, not even Scott called the cops. At about 6 o'clock, the Modesto police arrive. They're there to talk to Lacey's mother, stepfather, and Scott. One of the officers suggests that maybe Scott should head back to the house. And this is where badass detective Al Brocchini gets involved. He is the first detective on site at the Peterson house. As soon as he gets to the house, he goes in and starts looking through everything he possibly can. He immediately determines that there is no sign of forced entry, no sign of a struggle around the house, and there is no blood anywhere. He goes out, he's checking the cars. At this time that he's checking the cars, because both Lacey and Scott's car were there. Lacey's car was there the whole time. Scott brought his truck back, obviously, from his fishing trip. He notices that Scott is more worried about him dinging the doors of the cars on each other than he is about trying to get information about Lacey's whereabouts. Later that evening, they do take Scott down to the police station and sit him down for what is more of a formal interview. And he seems like he, for the most part, is cooperating with everything. He lets them know that they were totally happy, had absolutely no marriage problems and that he was worried about where his wife was. From that moment, Detective Albrochini is like, something just smells fishy, and it's clearly not your clothes from the marina because you decided to wash those motherfuckers right away. As the questioning goes on, the other detectives are starting to notice that Scott kind of seems like he doesn't give a fuck. He's super uninterested, he's not asking any questions, he's not asking like, is this going to be a priority? What do you need from me? What do we need to do? Is there going to be a search party? He's going along with what they're asking and what they're saying, but he's not doing anything more. Some officers even say that it feels like at certain times he's not even paying attention. Now I know what you're thinking. Everyone reacts to this differently. There's different emotions. Some people are more stoic, some people are more hysterical, but very rarely do they act uninterested. I should also mention that that first night they brought Scott in, Detective Al Brocchini said, hey, just so we can like start searching and eliminating things right away and try to find her as soon as possible, so we can eliminate you, will you just take a lie detector test? We can say, look, he didn't do it. We need to get to work on finding this woman. At first, Scott is like, yeah, let's do it. Now, Scott's dad claims that he instructed Scott to not do it. He said that it opened too many doors for there to be like a media outrage. So ultimately, Scott denies taking a lie detector test that very first night. This is another red fucking flag, you guys. Clearly, this story blows up in the media, but also blows up in this small community where everybody knows each other. The community actually takes um, like a business center of a local hotel and they make it into a volunteer center so that they can have people working on finding Lacey 24 hours a day. There's people out in the streets, they're searching, they're trying to find her path of where she walked the dog, there's tips coming in, they're handing out flyers, they're going door to door doing everything that they can. There was originally a $25,000 reward that was offered um, for any information leading to Lacey's safe return. This was later upped to $250,000 and finally capped at $500,000. Two days later, on December 26th, the police come back to the Peterson house, and this time with a warrant. When this happened, Scott actually tried to stop them from executing this warrant. He tried to get on the phone with an attorney. Luckily, the attorney didn't answer in time, and the police decided to just proceed with the warrant. Now, denying them access into your home with a warrant, again, sus as fuck, Scott. Like, at least try to be a good actor. The media could not get enough of this fucked up shit. A specific reporter by the name of Ted Rollins is really putting pressure on this case. He is outside of that Peterson home every single day. He claims he starts out there at like three in the morning and just every second that he sees Scott coming out, they've got a shot on him, he tries to interview him, and they're trying to get this case as much media coverage as possible. Now, for those of you that don't know kind of this situation and this theory and this way of going about it, normally when someone has a family member that they think is missing or has been taken in any sort of way, 
they love to feed this to the media. They love to get the word out there as much as possible. This puts as much pressure as possible on the police force to work endlessly on trying to find these people. The more pressure from the media means a better investigation. That's just how it works. So Scott being so against this is what is so sus about this whole thing. I know that if I were a man and my wife, eight months pregnant, is missing, I would be going to every single news station, reporter, website, newspaper, everything I possibly could and just put pressure on someone finding her. I would never be like, get out of my face, get off my street. And all of these shots of Scott being like totally over the media makes him look like he's also just not grieving. Again, everyone reacts differently, but you have to admit that this is like a little fucking sus. And at this point, both Lacey's family and Scott's family are absolutely positive that he has nothing to do with this. Look, mom, dad, my brothers, my friends, if this ever happens to me, don't fucking do that. All right, it is now December 30th, and police decide that they are going to hold a press conference because they say that they have what is believed to be a lead on Lacey Peterson's case. They say that they now know on that same day the house directly across the street from the Petersons was burglarized. The owners of the house were out of town, but a neighbor says that she sees a van with like two or three men outside of the house and she noticed because they looked at her in a very threatening way. It is said that this burglary was to have happened around 11.40 a.m., which would match up with the timeline where Lacey went missing. I know, this is turning into a whole shit show. Now there's a burglary they didn't know that happened. It is every, it, <sighs> who's in charge of this? Get it together. All right, everyone thinks they have a lead, they got the guys. Get this, they do get the guys. And it's later found out that this burglary happened on the 26th of December, those two days later. The main suspect in the burglary said, oh yeah, I totally fucking ripped off that house, but I didn't take a woman. But here's the weird part of this. Remember a couple minutes ago, we mentioned that dude, Ted Rowland, Remember we mentioned that he was outside of that house every single day? Well, according to Ted, and according to Ted's footage, that van was never there. That burglary did not happen on the 26th. Now, did the burglary happen before he got there and he's lying about his timeline of being there? Was the neighbor's account of the burglary total bullshit? Well, we'll never know because the police department was like, shut the fuck up, it's closed, that's it, goodbye. Again, more sus shit. Uh, ooh, that was a good one. I'm sorry if you think it's gross that I burp, but I only burp with you because remember, you give me gas. Oh, they're so good. Mm. Anna, you created a monster with these. Put these on everything. Put them on everything. I made some shrimp with these the other night. Oh. All right, guys, that 22 minutes is up with the first layer of our pizza bake. Now we are just going to go in with that Trader Joe's tomato basil marinara. This is the one that Anna recommended using on her website. And this shit is fucking good. And I'm a marinara snob. We're gonna go ahead and take one cup and spread it evenly over that mixture. Now, on January 24th, 2003, another fucking press conference is called. This time they say they have another lead in the Lacey Peterson case. Now, this is the press conference where it is stated, finally, that Scott was in another relationship with another woman by the name of Amber Frey. The best part of this is that at the press conference, the affair with Amber Frey is announced by Amber Frey. She literally is the only person when the press conference is called, walks out in her suit and is like, hey, I'm the girlfriend. She lets everyone know when their relationship started in late 2002 
She lets them know that she did not know Scott was married or had any other relationship with another woman. She also made it very clear that she had absolutely nothing to do with the abduction of Lacey Peterson. We are now gonna go in with whatever cheese you want. This was the one, again, recommended. There is another awesome vegan Trader Joe's version of this or your regular mozzarella. I don't know. I'm not gonna tell you how to live your fucking life, but maybe take a break from dairy this week. We're gonna go in with a layer of as much cheese as you would like. I love the way this one melts. I actually found a cheese that melts, you guys. And I'm going to put a shit ton on there. All right, we're gonna throw this in for another 15 minutes at the same 430 degree temperature. Now, I know what you're thinking. How the hell did they involve Amber in this? How did they find her? How did they do this? Well, Amber finds out about this obviously on the news. At first they don't release names, but the story just matches up way too fucking well. This is where Amber calls the tip line and she's like, Hi, how, how's, it, how's it going? I'm Amber and um, Scott told me his wife was dead months ago. She tells Detective Brocchini everything. She even says that during this time, Scott actually told her that he was gonna be traveling in Europe with some friends. Basically, it kind of sounds like he planned for this investigation to go on for a while. So he just told his girlfriend like, hey girl, I'm living my best life traveling Europe. I totally fucked up and forgot to mention and record that to make this sauce a little bit spicy, I actually threw in two teaspoons of those hot peppers. Now, let me tell you, if there's one thing you take from this recipe, buy this. It is really spicy though, so be careful. So this is where the police decide that they are going to head over to Radio Shack at the time and attach a recording device to Amber's phone. From there, they record all of the calls that go back and forth between Amber and Scott. Now, this is where Scott is at candlelight vigils, press conferences, all of it, and he's on the phone telling Amber, yeah, I'm sorry, it's really loud. I'm at the Eiffel Tower. I'm sorry, I can't hear you, I'm in Spain. What a fuck nugget. And it sucks because at this time there was no social media, there was no stalking and geotagging and posting on your story. So she could have totally believed that that's what was happening. I couldn't imagine not being able to lurk. A great place to listen to a lot of these phone calls is um, the Hulu docu-series about this. I would highly recommend going and watching it after this episode. So basically, when Scott is questioned about this, he claims that he did not tell the police about Amber because he was afraid that once he did, they would stop looking for Lacey and Connor. You still need to find them, Scott. Now the police are really scared that Scott fucking offed his family to go be with this woman. So they search the Berkeley Marina and they find nothing. And there are so many conflicting stories on if people saw Lacey walking the dog, if it even was Lacey, what her path was, and they just search everywhere that people said they might have seen her. Again, they come up with nothing. Finally, the police let Amber's family and Scott's family know about this extramarital affair. This is where Amber's family finally has a realization. Holy fuck, Scott did this. So, of course, Scott goes and does a shit ton of televised interviews. And as he's doing them, this motherfucker is just digging himself deeper and deeper into his grave. At one point, he even admits that, yes, he had the affair, Yes, Lacey knew about the affair. Of course it caused a terrible fight, but nothing that would ever break them up. Dude, shut the fuck up. Now there are very little leads, but we are going to jump forward to April 14th, 2003. This is where the story gets sad. A couple walking their dog find the body of an unborn baby boy washed up on the San Francisco Bay. The umbilical cord was still attached, but was clearly ripped. One and a half loops of nylon tape was around the baby's neck, and there was a significant cut on the body. They did not say where. This is actually privileged information that was later leaked. The body was decomposing, but for some reason was well-preserved. One day later, what is believed to be Lacey's body washes up on the San Francisco Bay, 
one mile away from where they found what was believed to be the body of Connor. Now this body was so badly decomposed, they were absolutely going to need DNA proof that this was Lacey. She was decapitated and all of her limbs were detached from her torso. That is when they realized that the reason the baby was well preserved was because he actually came out of Lacey post-mortem. Now the investigation can actually properly start with these bodies. And now they just know that this is Scott. Throughout the investigation, they find out that Scott did have multiple affairs with multiple women. And all of those women, he did state to them that he was totally single or a widow. The police finally get an arrest warrant for Scott. They just have to make sure that the DNA comes back and that is absolutely Lacey and Connor's body at this time. It does take a little bit of time to get those results back. They're waiting for just the right time to serve this warrant the minute they get the call that they know that those are the bodies of Lacey and Connor Peterson. They find out that Scott is staying out in San Diego at this time and someone must have tipped Scott off that this was going to happen. On April 18th, 2003, Scott was arrested. He was arrested on his way to quote, play golf with his father and his brother. He noticed some vehicles following him. He stated that he thought they were the media. He takes them on kind of a teasing high-speed chase, driving erratically, cutting people off, and he's very close to the border. Now, if you know San Diego, the area that he was staying in was about 30 miles away from the border, and he was driving down that freeway, and they just knew exactly what was going on. Because he was driving so erratically, they were able to finally turn on their lights in those unmarked cop cars and pull him over. They pull this fucker over and guess what? His hair is dyed blonde, his car is completely overstuffed with bullshit, including $15,000 cash, 12 Viagra tablets, survival gear, camping equipment, several changes of clothes, four cell phones, and two driver's licenses. Now they claim the second driver's license was his brother's, and that was proved. The dad says that he had his brother's driver's license so he could get a discount at the golf course. Yes, that is the bullshit you smell. They also said he had all of that other stuff in his car because he was actually living out of his car at the time because of the unwanted media attention. Yes, if the scent got stronger, that's even more bullshit, ladies and gentlemen. The police are like, really, dude? You're teasing us with a high-speed chase down the border. You have all of this in your car. You changed your look because not only was his hair blonde, he grew out a beard. And you're gonna try to tell us that you weren't trying to flee to Mexico. Okay. So many of these are just like made for TV movie moments that people really think they're gonna get away with. So now it is officially trial time. Obviously Scott immediately pleads guilty when they first take him in. And that's when the DA decides that they are going to seek the death penalty for this. It's said that Scott's family pays roughly $1 million to attorney Mark Garagos. He's a super high profile attorney known for taking some controversial cases. And all they really have to go on is they push this narrative that Scott Peterson is just not a violent man. Like there's no way he could have done it. Impossible. After all that comes to light, on November 12th, 2004, Scott Peterson was convicted of first degree murder for the death of Lacey and second degree murder for the death of their unborn son, Connor. Scott was sentenced to death. The end. Bye. Yeah, no, you didn't think that was the end, did you? Our pizza bake is done. We are going to take it out of the oven and let it rest and cool while we finish up this story. It's a pizza bake made with cauliflower gnocchi. All right, conclusion. Yes, we thought everything was all fine and dandy. He was gonna get sentenced to death. But in March of 2019, the California governor, Gavin Newsom, he issued a uh, meritorium, I don't know, but it said that all 737 prisoners that were on death row here in California alone, this obviously included Scott, the order basically postponed all of the executions for the duration of Newsom's tenure as governor. So he wasn't going to get executed while Newsom was governor. This gave him enough time to put together an appeal. On August 24th, 2020, 
In a 7-0 decision at the Supreme Court of California, they upheld Scott's conviction, but overturned his death penalty. I guess basically this was because they found out that there were some jurors that were dismissed because they opposed capital punishment, but they were never asked if they could put their views aside for this specific case. Now, not a lot of questioning could happen because that judge had since died. It was believed that that judge stacked the jury against Scott so he would receive the death penalty. There is so much argument about this case. Did he do it? Did he not do it? Everyone has their own theory about it. What do I think? Well, ladies and gentlemen, my completely unprofessional opinion is that Scott is a motherfucker. He killed his wife and son to be with young Amber and gaslighted Amber every time she felt that something was just a little bit off. All right, let's cut into this shit and end the video. So there are so many different theories and ideas. A lot of people say that it wasn't Lacey everyone saw walking their dog. It was also said that they did not bring witnesses in that clearly saw Scott at the marina completely alone. I don't know guys, what do you think? No, really, what do you think? It would be really awesome if you commented down below your ideas on this case because I kind of feel like at this point there's no wrong answers. Anna, Anna, you did it. Wow. All right. Thank you guys so much for cooking with me and hanging out with me this week. I hope you learned a little something about this case and trust me, I really hope you guys make this dish. It's absolutely delicious. The recipe and ingredients will be linked below. Don't forget to like and subscribe and comment future crimes you want me to cover or some recipes you want me to make. Thank you for watching Spooky Sunday Dinners. I am still singing. I still can't afford a theme song. I know I can balance it. I know I can. All right, Doug has to try this.